Welcome, everybody. Thanks so much for coming on tonight or watching if you're on the replay. Uh, my name is Julie. We're going to be diving into sleep and recovery tonight, talking about its role in performance. Just to get started, if you have any questions, if you want to write them in the chat, um, that totally works, and I'll get to them at the end. Or you can obviously ask your question out loud at the end, too. I can't see the chat right now, so I, I won't get to it right away. Um, or Haley, you're welcome to like jump in with questions as we go. Yeah, I can but, monitor. Yeah, the end sounds cool, too. Awesome. So to start a little bit about me, uh, my name's Julie. I am currently working as a performance physical therapist just outside of Baltimore, Maryland. I also am a strength and conditioning coach and very proud to have worked with a ton of female athletes primarily, um, but really all kinds of athletes ranging from high school, college, professional level. I also am very much a fitness enthusiast, so played field hockey in college and ever since then have been hooked on just trying all different kinds of fitness modalities the clinic, physical therapy clinic I work in is actually inside of a CrossFit gym. Uh, so I'm working with a ton of CrossFit women right now, which I'm loving. And on top of those things, I also am the host of a mental and physical fitness themed podcast called the Goal Set Mindset Podcast, uh, which Haley was on. And I'll share that episode at the end with you girls. So today's conversation, we are talking about sleep and recovery specifically its role in mental and physical performance. As a physical therapist, coach, fitness enthusiast myself, sleep and recovery is something that I talk about with everybody I work with because it truly is such a powerful level lever to pull to get from where you are now to where you want to be. We're also going to discuss the difference between overtraining and under-recovering, discussing how sleep has an influence on injury as well as pain experience. And then lastly, I'm going to leave you ladies with some practical strategies that you can use now to improve your sleep and recovery. So to get started, recovery, I think is something that a lot of us have started to pay more attention to over the last few years. There's all kinds of wearables out there now, and people are kind of talking about it. But at its core, recovery is essentially the processes that occur following a bout of stress to promote rejuvenation and growth of our body tissues. Specifically, in terms of performance, we're concerned about those musculoskeletal, cardiovascular, and nervous systems. And just to kind of put things in perspective, one thing that I feel very strongly about is that so many of us really focus our energy on what's happening in the gym. You know, like the one hour a day that you're training, you're really going all in on that. But what about all the other time in your day or in your week? So if we think about the average CrossFitter training, maybe five to 10 hours a week, and we do the math, that only makes up 6% of your time in a week span, 6%. So we need to make sure that we're also focusing on that other 94% of your time that's really going to have the biggest impact on your goals and your progress. And that 94% is what we are focusing on today. Another concept that I love to talk about is this idea of overtraining versus under-recovering. So overtraining is something that a lot of people who are heavily involved in fitness will experience at some time um, just because of pushing yourself. A lot of times as a physical therapist and as a coach, and even in myself, when I see symptoms of overtraining occurring, we have to also look at recovery. Overtraining might simply be that a person just isn't recovering to the point of being able to perform their daily activities. A classic example of this is, let's say you participate in CrossFit. One of my patients right now, she is super fit, super in shape, very strong. She has elbow pain. So that would be labeled as an overuse injury based on how she's presenting. But I hate using that overuse term because it's like, you're really strong. Clearly the rest of your body can handle this, but there's some kind of mismatch between your elbow and what the rest of your body is doing. And same goes for recovery. So think about your phone. Probably every night before you go to bed, you plug your phone in and ideally you wake up with a full charge the next day. So that when you wake up and you want to scroll through Instagram and then hop over to TikTok, and then maybe you call your mom and then maybe you check your email, you're asking your phone to do all these things. 
and it can handle it because it's got a full charge. Whereas when your phone battery drains and it's down at like 10% and everything is lagging and you're trying to upload that Instagram story and it's just not going, it's because your, your phone just doesn't have the juice. Our bodies work very similarly. So if you are in this chronic state of under recovering, regardless of if your body is truly physically capable of performing the stressful task, you're not going to be able to give it your best. So functional overreaching is where we push ourselves into that threshold over the limit of our capacity in order to improve. But in order to get benefits, recovery is what makes the difference between overreaching and overtraining. And when we think about creating this balance of stress versus capacity, or I like to call it load versus capacity, load are all of the things that happen during the day that requires energy from you, from your brain, from your body, things like exercise, maybe you take CrossFit classes, maybe you go out for runs, maybe you do home workouts, that exercise is load. We also have things like work stress all of the mental and emotional energy that goes into doing your job, navigating relationships, all of this stuff takes energy. And then we look at our capacity to perform that. The things that contribute to our capacity to perform stress, the biggest levers are nutrition, of course, which I know you ladies are all dialed in on. Also mindfulness. And then last but not least, sleep. So today's conversation is going to be focused on sleep and how we can create this balance where your capacity to perform work exceeds the amount of work that you need to do and you remain in that balanced state. So sleep is something that we all know we need, but when we look at the actual physiology of why we need it, first off, sleep is the only thing that we have in common with every other living thing on the planet. Every single living thing sleeps and will likely die within a few days of not getting sleep. It is the single most effective way to reset your brain and body each day. All of our body systems adapt and repair and restore during sleep. And again, just to mention that those adaptations that you're looking for from the gym, increasing muscle, getting stronger, getting more skilled, losing body fat, all of that happens during sleep, not actually in the gym itself. Matthew Walker is a leading researcher in sleep science. He's one of the big names that everybody knows. This is one of my favorite quotes from his book, Why We Sleep, which is actually on this bookshelf behind me because it's one of my favorites. And this quote is that sleep is the greatest legal performance enhancing drug that most people are probably neglecting. So sleep is really fascinating because there's all kinds of stages and I will spare you guys from the super nitty gritty science that I'm interested in, but just to appreciate some of the architecture here of our sleep cycles. There are four main stages of sleep that we go through and we cycle through them as the night goes on. These include REM sleep and then three stages of deep sleep. So to dive into that a little bit and why we need both of these sleep stages, non-REM sleep refers to deep sleep. This is the sleep that primarily occurs early on in the night. And generally speaking, it's primarily focused on restoring the body, restoring your physical self. During this phase of sleep, we see repair and regrowing of body tissues. Growth hormone is released at high quantities, which is crucial for improving your lean body mass. We also see effects on strengthening the immune system during this phase of sleep. And it also has a tremendous influence on metabolism and supporting metabolic health. So during REM sleep or non-REM sleep, when they look at brain waves of this stage, we see that the brain waves and electrical activity in the brain move really slowly into like a nice sinus rhythm. What that tells us is that most of the energy in our body is being directed to the body and the brain is kind of just on like low power mode. A little fun fact here, caffeine has been shown to influence deep sleep 
So in general, consuming it after like 2 to 3 p.m. does run a risk of getting in the way of this sleep stage. Now shifting gears to REM sleep. REM sleep is our dream sleep. And it's called rapid eye movement sleep because during this stage of sleep, your entire body is actually paralyzed, which is so weird, I know. Your body down-regulates the stimulation of your mus muscle tissue. And the only things that actually maintain movement is your eyes and your inner ear muscles. So during this stage in sleep, all of that energy is going from restoring the body to restoring the mind. During this phase of sleep, we see things like memory consolidation, regulating your mood and emotions, everything that you had to deal with throughout the day, everything that you're processing. Your brain is literally like, think of, um, have you guys ever had your computer desktop just be like super overwhelming with like pictures and documents and folders or like you're doing a project and you have like 5 million tabs and you don't even know what's going on. That's what your brain looks like when you go to sleep, if you're anything like me. And while you're in REM sleep, your brain is like putting the pictures in a folder and deleting the things that aren't necessary and organizing things nicely into, you know, buckets. Like that's what's happening during REM sleep. And it is so crucial to wake up the next day and feel your best. We also see strong effects on anxiety, depression, and other psychological problems with getting sufficient REM sleep. And honestly, to sum it up, this meme is just like so relatable to me. When you don't get enough sleep and you're just like irritable and agitated and everything bothers you, probably due to not getting enough REM. So when we think about sleep and its role in performance, because I know you ladies are fitness loving women like myself, and you really want to know like what's going to help take me to the next level. We think about our body's ability to adapt. If you are focused on body composition, on improving your performance, feeling stronger and more energized and more comfortable in your skin, we want to be able to adapt well to what we're doing throughout the day. So processes like muscle hypertrophy, motor unit recruitment, and improving your cardiovascular health, a lot of these gains are supported by sufficient sleep. Body composition also is very strongly tied to sleep. We're going to get into some really cool research in a second about this, but we see increases in lean body mass and decreases in fat mass when individuals sleep longer versus shorter. And then last but not least, exercise technique is so important to those of you looking to make gains in the gym. There are some people nowadays on Instagram and stuff who are like, you don't need to worry about form. And as a physical therapist, maybe I'm a bit biased, but technique definitely matters, not only for injury prevention, but also for maximizing performance and things like learning new movements and mentally being ready to learn new tasks and this concept of muscle memory, where you kind of like get the hang of a movement, all of that is supported by sleep. So thinking about CrossFit specifically, now that I've been exposed to it in a, in a larger um, scale, man, does CrossFit have so much to do with technique, right? Of any other athlete that I'm working with, these athletes need to dial in on this stuff. Think about movements like the muscle up or the snatch that are really technical. And in order to actually get better at those lifts, you need to be like cognitively paying attention, right? Like your coach might be giving you cues about, you know, like the triple extension and being explosive and external rotation or whatever it is. In order to truly master these things and improve at them, if that's something that you want to do, your brain has to be ready to go. This isn't just like your go to the gym and mindlessly walk on the treadmill for 30 minutes. Like this shit is hard. So make sure you're giving your body the chance that it needs to be physically and mentally prepared for it. This is a little diagram, just again, shedding a light on the role that sleep has in sport performance and a few of the facets that it, react, that it affects. Weight control, motivation, decision-making, the list goes on and on, but something to appreciate here. Now diving into some research. 
Ladies, if you are going to take one thing away from this conversation, it is this study. This is one of my favorite scientific studies of all time. What the researchers did here was they took a group of people, a pretty small group, only 10 individuals, and they spent two weeks in a sleep lab. In this lab, everything that they did was controlled and measured. How much they slept, how much they ate, how much they moved. All of these individuals were overweight and had some weight that they wanted to lose. So what they did was they provided all of the individuals with the food that they were going to eat so that it could be measured. They were split into two groups. One group had four people, one group had six people. The only difference between the groups was the amount of time that they were given to sleep. <clears throat> so one group was given five and a half hours to spend in bed. The other group was given eight and a half hours to spend in bed. All of them were in a calorie deficit and all of these individuals experienced both um, dependent variables, like they did it another time later down the road. When they took measurements of these people after the two weeks spent in the lab, what they found was that both groups lost a similar amount of weight. So two weeks in a calorie deficit, macros, calories, everything tracked, everything standardized to their specific body weight. And the only difference was sleep. They lost a very similar amount of weight, about three kilograms or six and a half pounds of body mass. But a stark difference in the type of weight that they lost. So check this out, what I had bolded, the percentage of weight lost as fat. The individuals, men and women, who were given eight and a half hours in bed, lost 56% of that weight from fat. Compared to the group who only spent five and a half hours in bed, only 25% of that six kilograms, or sorry, six pounds, was fat. And on the contrary, the individuals who slept more maintained much more of their lean body mass. They only lost about one and a half kilograms compared to that five and a half hour group, lost 2.4 kilograms of lean body mass. So ladies, when we think about weight loss, we aren't just trying to cut the number on the scale. Of course, that's part of it. It's a good measurement, but we are trying to lose fat mass and hold on to the good stuff the sexy stuff, the stuff that makes us feel strong and energized and supports health. Another interesting thing from here is the post-study resting metabolic rate. So essentially how much calories you're burning at rest. The individuals who were given that eight and a half hours, which by the way, might sound like a lot, they only slept an average of seven and a quarter hours. So even though they were given all that time in bed, they slept you know, a normal amount, less than eight hours their resting metabolic rate was higher at the end of the, of the study compared to the group who slept less. Again, shows us that relationship between sleep and metabolism. And then lastly, ghrelin concentration was measured, which ghrelin is the hormone that signals to your brain that it's time to eat and that you're hungry. The individuals who slept more had suppressed levels of ghrelin compared to the group who slept less actually had an increase in this hormone concentration. So not only are they losing more body mass, more lean body mass, their metabolism is suffering and their hormones are telling them that they're hungrier than they should be. Crazy stuff here, right? Another study looked at the impact of sleep on food choices. So we know one of the biggest limitations of sticking to a healthy nutrition plan is the discipline and motivation to choose the right foods, especially at social gatherings and things like that. So this study shed a light on the fact that sleep deprivation, so when you are not getting enough sleep, it actually reduces stimulation to the brain regions that help you decide whether or not you're full and it amplifies amygdala activity, which essentially means that the emotional part of your brain is cranked up. As sleep decreases, humans have an increased desire for calorically dense, hyperpalatable foods. 
you are much more likely to reach for the chicken tenders and fries over the chicken breast if you are sleep deprived. And science has proved this. I mean, I'm sure we've all been there too, where when you're sleep deprived, like the last thing you want is a nice healthy meal. This study saw that those who were sleep deprived consumed an average of 600 more calories per day simply by not getting enough sleep. Looking at sleep and injury, this is something that anecdotally I have seen tremendous improvements with individuals just by talking to them about sleep and sleep hygiene and the impact that it has on injury progression. But at the scientific level, they've seen a trend in the impact of injury risk and sleep. And when we think about it, we know that sleep is going to support all of that body regrowth, right? Like repairing your immune system, repairing your bones and muscles, all of this stuff that you're beating up during your workouts, you need to give it the time to rebuild stronger. This happens during sleep. So if you're not getting enough sleep and you're always running on like that 50% battery and draining yourself by the time three, four o'clock in the afternoon rolls around, you're going to be at a much higher chance of injuring yourself not just because of your tissues, not getting the recovery that they need, but also because of sleep's impact on strength, cognitive performance, reaction time, all the things that are important while you're working out to exercise safely. There are also studies that show that being sleep deprived increases pain pathway activity. So if you're somebody who is struggling with an injury or a nagging ache or pain, Getting enough sleep is really important to making sure that those signals don't get too ramped up. And unfortunately, we see that a lot in chronic pain patients. Now, this is a study that looked at how sleep quality can have an impact on CrossFit performance. So very specific population that they looked at here, CrossFit athletes, not just highly competitive athletes, but a whole survey sent out to um, a whole bunch of people. There were about 150 people who completed this survey. And essentially what they looked at was asking people before the start of the study, what their general fitness was like, cardiovascular health, what their five rep max and one rep max were for the back squat, deadlift, bench press, snatch. And they took all of this data about fitness levels. They also did um, some of the hero workouts as well as girls workouts and gymnastics moves. Basically got a bunch of data of like, how are you performing in all of these facets of CrossFit? Then they surveyed them about sleep over the course of four weeks. How long did you sleep? How well rested did you feel? How was your quality? So on and so forth. What they found at the end of the study, which was four weeks, is that the individuals with high sleep quality demonstrated more improvement in all of these metrics compared to those with poor sleep quality. So as you can see over the span of the four weeks, both groups improved, like looking at that five rep max category. The high sleep quality had a 65% improvement and the low sleep quality still saw 56% improvement. But, in terms of statistical significance, people who had higher sleep quality improved significantly more in those standardized workouts, the hero and the girls workouts, 62% compared to 24%. Big difference there. As well as the gymnastics movements, which like we talked about before, so technical, takes so much like focus and also they're just really freaking hard right <laughs> to do the bar muscle ups and the toes to bar and the strict pull ups so it's no wonder that the people who sleep more saw a significant improvement in performance this really sheds a light on if you are somebody who has experienced plateaus or you're not quite moving at the pace that you want to be in your body composition in your performance in your energy levels ladies check in on your sleep, it might be the key that you are missing. So when it comes to sleep, there's kind of a wide variety in recommendations of like, what do we really need? 
The average adult, it's recommended by the National Sleep Foundation to sleep about seven to nine hours a night, pretty standard. CrossFit actually recommends that their competitive athletes sleep upwards of nine to 10 hours per night. There are so many uh, wearables right now. I wear a Whoop band personally that actually gives um, personal sleep recommendations based on my activity level. This is not an ad, I'm not sponsored by Whoop, but that is a goal one day. Um, so check this out. This was some of my data actually from today. So not to have a whole conversation on Whoop, but basically they calculate how much effort you gave during the day, how many calories you burned, what your overall effort was. And then based on that, we'll tell you how much sleep it thinks that you need. So last night, Whoop was like, hey, based on everything you did, eight hours and four minutes should be pretty solid. I only slept just shy of seven hours. So I get a score of a B plus for last night's sleep, which all things considered is pretty good. Seven to nine hours for most people is going to be a good place to shoot for. But getting more sleep than you're already getting can be hard to do. One thing that I've realized as a clinician, as a coach, is it's a lot easier to help people sleep better than to tell people to sleep more. And in my opinion, focusing on sleep quality is actually more powerful than purely focusing on sleep quantity. So now we're getting into my favorite tips, my favorite hacks, if you will, that have helped me sleep better that you can start doing right now. First off is morning sunlight. I'm not sure if any of you are fans of or have listened to the Huberman Lab podcast. Um, if you're a nerd like me, you'll totally want to check that out. He talks a ton about the science of morning sunlight and the influence that it has on wakefulness, energy levels, and just overall health. Sunlight exposure jumpstarts our circadian rhythm, which is essentially a 24-hour clock that tells us when we should be awake and asleep. Morning sunlight is one of the best cues to keep that in check. It is also a very powerful sensory input and communicates to every cell in our body that like it's time to go. Also, seeing sunlight in the morning helps to actually build sleep pressure later in the night. So if you have trouble falling asleep at night, getting sunlight in the morning can actually help you feel sleepier at night. Pretty crazy. So I like to get sunlight in the morning by going for like a five to 10 minute walk or doing some meditation. Um, I look really serious in this screenshot, I just realized. <laughs> just trying to meditate a little bit, do some breathing. Um, but anything that you can get under the sun, whether it's cloudy, sunny, doesn't matter. If you wake up before the sun comes up, turning on all the lights in your home is another way to stimulate this system. Sleep consistency is another big one. Here's a little um, image of that circadian rhythm I just mentioned. Our body loves consistency and rhythm and it likes to be able to predict what's coming next. A lot of you may have experienced this with nutrition. I know for me personally, even though it can get boring, eating similar foods at similar times tends to feel a lot better for my overall digestion and energy levels and just mental awareness of how I'm feeling because your body likes these cycles. So similarly, if you can go to sleep and wake up around the same time, you're going to be much more likely to achieve those nice REM and deep sleep stages where all of the magic happens and all of the adaptation happens that you are looking for. The only time I recommend sleeping in is when you're making up for lost sleep. So if you wake up on Saturday morning and you like naturally wake up at 7 a.m. because that's when you wake up during the week, just, just get out of bed and just get going with your day. Like I know it can get frustrating, but you're actually going to do yourself a lot of favors if you can stick to that rhythm. The other thing we want to consider is making your room as close to a cave as possible. I'm talking dark, cold, and quiet. Our eyes are so sensitive to light at all times, 
but especially in the evening. So if you can, making your home as dark as possible, dimming your screens, and ideally when you're sleeping, wearing either a sleep mask or blackout curtains to keep that dark environment so that you're not getting any stimulation from devices or light coming through the window. Because believe it or not, even if it doesn't wake you up, it can be disturbing to those deeper sleep stages. This is my personal sleep mask on the screen right now. Guys, life-changing. 20 bucks on Amazon, shameless plug. I would totally recommend anybody get it. Um, it's awesome. And then temperature wise, your room should be pretty cold. I sleep best when it's like 58, 59 degrees. And my boyfriend complains every time, but he can deal with it because um, your girl needs her beauty sleep. So playing around with the temperature, colder is better, is also going to support those deep sleep stages. Last but not least, consider copying a pair of earplugs to take with you on the go so that if you're in a noisy environment, you can keep it quiet. Screen time. Screen time is a big topic when it comes to sleep. Blue light is something that a lot of us have been talking about over the last few years. Blue light does have a detrimental effect on sleep, primarily because it interrupts the production of melatonin, which is our sleepiness hormone in our brain. So when we're looking at screens, not just the blue light, but also the intensity is very stimulating. And you may have experienced before where like you're studying or you're watching a show or you're doing something on your screens and you're tired, like you feel tired and you get into bed and then you just lay there like this and you're like, why can't I fall asleep? And it takes forever. That's probably because your melatonin didn't get a chance to build up enough. Now, I wouldn't recommend supplementing with melatonin, at least re like not regularly, um, that's a whole nother conversation. You can look up some recommendations on that. But long story short here, if you need to be in front of your screens, like we all are right now, cop a pair of blue light glasses. Your girl got these on Amazon for like eight or nine bucks. Um, definitely helpful, at least according to my anecdotal data. And last but not least, let's talk alcohol. A little true or false here for you guys. Is consuming alcohol before bed? going to help you sleep better. Alcohol is like the most common sleep aid that people are relying on. What do we think? Is it actually gonna help? What do you think, Kelly? Probably not, unlikely, right? According to research, this is false. Consuming alcohol before bed is not helpful. Now, alcohol does help people pass out because it's a sedative. So it kind of like down regulates your body's systems and makes you feel sleepy. But alcohol is also a toxin. So when you go to sleep with alcohol in your system, your body is going to devote all of that energy that we talked about before to getting that alcohol out of your system and fighting it. You're not going to get that restorative energy to your brain or to your muscles or to your immune system. So I don't know about any of you guys, but like there are some nights that I go out with friends and have a couple of drinks and you wake up the next day and you're like sore and you're like, did I just dance a lot? <laughs> like maybe, but it's likely that your body just didn't get a chance to actually rejuvenate at all because it was so focused on the alcohol. They've seen that just two drinks before bed can have a drastic effect on REM sleep. And like we mentioned, alcohol is a toxin. So it actually is like a stressful trigger to your body and makes it really hard to calm down. So this is a little story here about um, some of my data with alcohol and my recovery. I'm not gonna go into it, but this is me and my college friends getting together in Philly, um, essentially. We had a couple of drinks throughout the day, had a good time, went to happy hour, didn't stay out too late. I was back in my friend's place by like 11 o'clock at night and slept like pretty okay. I got a B minus 80%. Whoop wanted me to sleep eight hours. I slept about six, but all things considered, sleep was, was decent. This is a quick little note to show you that sleep and recovery don't always go hand in hand. So 
Sleep is very important, but even if you're getting enough sleep, it doesn't mean that your quality is good. So another thing about WHOOP is that WHOOP gives you a recovery score on a scale of one to 100 of how well recovered you are and therefore how capable your body is of performing tasks the next day. The day after this event, I slept pretty good. I didn't wake up feeling hungover or anything because we didn't drink late. I woke up with a whopping 1% recovery. Ladies, my body was simply keeping me alive. <laughs> and what's interesting about this is looking specifically at the data on the bottom, heart rate variability typically for me is really high, 130, 140. It was down to six, which is highly indicative of my body being in a very stressful state. My resting heart rate, while I was sleeping, was 109. That's like low intensity exercise right there. That's how stressed out my body was from working through all of the mimosas and you know Moscow mules I drank. But again, sleep is decent. So if you're gonna drink alcohol, do it. Do it in moderation, one to two drinks better to drink during the day than at night. So if that's your thing, no worries there. As we wrap up here, optimizing health is going to be the priority for many of us. I know it is for me at this point in life. And our three pillars of health optimization are exercise, nutrition, and sleep. And these are so closely interwoven. Your success in exercise is going to be influenced by your nutrition and your sleep. Your success in nutrition is going to be influenced by your exercise and sleep. Your success in sleep, your ability to sleep well, your um, body's ability to restore is also going to depend on these other things. So make sure that they are all considerations that you're taking into account. So in conclusion here, sleep is highly individualized but the basic principles are universal. It impacts all aspects of performance, including body comp, musculoskeletal function, and injury risk, all of the things that we care about, right? Prioritizing sleep quality is going to be key over sleep quantity. And remember that sleep is crucial to your mental, physical, emotional, social, spiritual, all of the well-beings that exist in the world. Sleep has an impact on so don't take it lightly. Some references for you gals. I have a couple of articles that I've referenced. Those are listed here. And Why We Sleep by Matthew Walker is where I've learned a lot of these principles. So anything that isn't cited by a research article likely came from this book. If you are interested in learning more about sleep, this is a great place to start. And that is all for me. Thank you gals so much for being here tonight, for checking things out. I would love to take any questions pertaining to the presentation today um, or anything else you're interested in asking me related to my background. I would love to connect with any of you on social media. You can find me at goalsetmindset underscore JP. I have a podcast, like I mentioned in the beginning, bottom left of the screen, you can see my episode I recorded with your girl, Haley. She absolutely crushed it. We had a really fun conversation about macro tracking and ditch ditching restrictive diets. I uh, would love if you scrolled back and found that one. And yeah, feel free to reach out to me down the road. Would love to connect, answer any questions. I work with women just like you every single day and it is absolutely my passion. Um, so don't hesitate to ever reach out. Other than that, I would be happy to take any questions that you ladies might have. Heck yeah, first and foremost, Thank you. That was phenomenal. That was just even knowing a lot of those things, hearing them in a different perspective, especially from the sleep quality standpoint, that would like, that's not something I think about very often, um, especially since I ditched my whoop for sure. Cause I don't yeah. see that data every day anymore. Um, but yeah, the alcohol that that's real. I very rarely drink, but when I woke up the next morning and I saw that I was like, am I alive? <laughs> yeah, honestly, it's honestly. Crazy. All right, ladies. So if you have a question, if you want to raise your hand so that I can unmute you just right now. Um, I have a question. I'm Melissa, by the way. 
Nice to meet you, Melissa. Um, does it matter, like, if you, like, does all your sleep have to be done at one time? Or, like, let's say, like, like I have a really weird schedule because I work in the hospital. So does it matter, like, if you sleep, like, four or five hours and then you, like, take a nap? Or do you have to do it all in one yeah, that's a really good question and something that's being pretty closely explored right now by sleep researchers. Um, do you work nights? Like, do your shifts vary? Some of them aren't. Like, yeah, like we go like, like the theory is they make you go forward in time because you're not allowed to have, like, legally you have to have a certain amount of hours in between each shift. So like you start at 6 a.m. and then the next day you start at 12 p.m. and then the next day you start at 4 p.m. so they like push you forward so like you're constantly sleeping at like a different time. Yeah. yeah so in that case from the information that I've learned and people that I've heard speak about this making sure that you just get enough sleep throughout the day is the most important thing. Um, so naps are great in that case like if you can only get a four or five hour block of sleep and then you can get another two to three hours later that's <laughs> going to be relatively sufficient, but unfortunately it doesn't replace the consistent same time each day um, mm -hmm. sleep that your circadian rhythm, you know, really wants. But yeah, I would definitely focus more so on like over the course of a few days, just trying to hit that seven to eight hour mark per day, even if you have to split it up. And the other thing I'll say is use some of those, um, hacks, if you will, to your advantage. So like, let's say you're on the way home from the hospital and it's the middle of the day and you're going to go to sleep at like three o'clock in the afternoon or 12 o'clock wearing sunglasses and kind of dimming the light, um, making sure the lights are dark in your home, like using some of these cues to either be awake or be sleepy has been really helpful for people who work those odd hours. Yeah, that's the hard part because it's like you're always tired, but then when you go to sleep, like your brain is like so yeah, wired. Totally. And so like, and you you're never like going to bed at the same time. Yeah, yeah, that's a big struggle, and I would recommend looking at some of um. If you look at Whoop's website, they also have a podcast. I believe they put out some pretty cool content for shift workers specifically about some of these questions. Um, so I would check there, but yeah, it's. I, I don't work a schedule like that. I can't imagine. So God bless you for doing that. Um, but yeah, definitely just find what works for you, like what helps you sleep better. I know some people do supplement with melatonin in those cases. Um, but yeah, it's definitely, it's a real challenge for sure. But good that you're thinking about it. From that perspective yeah. too, I would just be kind of more mindful of your caffeine intake. It's going to have a cutoff at different times of the day versus like two to 3 p.m. for most people who go to bed at like anywhere between nine and 10. Um, so being mindful of that, especially if you experience being very wired when you're trying to go to sleep, being mindful yeah. of caffeine consumption. Like if you know you're gonna be going to bed at 12 in the afternoon that day, stopping your intake at like 4 a.m. Cause caffeine does have a half-life of eight hours. So it can last in your system for that long mm -hmm. yeah like my physical body is like so tired but like my brain takes like two hours after a shift to calm down but if your shift ends at four o'clock in the morning you're like oh my god just fall asleep fall asleep fall asleep yeah. yeah yeah definitely and I mean if you have the opportunity like depending on what your role is in the hospital if you're charting a lot or if you're on the computer a lot like yeah you like glasses at your screen that can have an impact, like just trying to play around with some of those different uh, variables, you know? Yeah, that's a good thought. I, I don't have a blue light, so I probably stare at my computer too much. I mean, honestly, you can get cheap ones and you, you can't tell when you're wearing them, like if they're working or not. Um, and Whoop, by no means is it the end all be all, but I think the data is pretty cool. And I've seen like a tremendous influence on my recovery scores when I wear these. Um, hmm. And maybe there's a placebo effect, but the placebo effect is the the strongest proven uh, drug in the world. Oh yeah, I love yeah. the placebo effect. I love the placebo yeah. effect. Me too, me too, girl. Thank you. Thank you guys so much for being here. Um, feel free to follow me on the gram. I would love to connect with you guys. And 
if you ever got any PT questions and you want to chat with somebody who gets it, um, I got you. Hit me up. Unless you have two PT students right here. So yeah. Have you passed farm? <laughs> <laughs> pass farm you might barely pass farm but you'll pass farm awesome well you ladies have a great rest of your night and i will talk to you guys in the bad bitch collective tomorrow